and welcome to The Dive Down, a Magic the Gathering podcast for the casual spike focused on the latest decks, trends, and strategies in modern. My name is Stanislav here in Chicago, and with me on the line from Denver, Colorado, it's the one and only Shane Beeps. Stan, I cannot wait to drink from this gilded goblet of which we will talk about tonight. Yeah, and that was the original name of the card, fun fact. Also with us here in Chicago, the godfather himself, Dave. Welcome to this week's episode of My Wizard, My Wizard, My Wizard and Me, an advice (laughs) podcast for the modern format. (laughs) Oh man, how long have you had that in your back pocket? About three three or four minutes. They're going to sue us. I don't want to see you in court juice. Last but not least, it's the warden in town, Zach Colpan. Uh, chalice on one and I pass. <laughs> not again. <laughs> Always gets me. All right, we start this week like we start every week with a little bit of housekeeping. Big thanks to some new reviews we got from Intraocular, who we actually missed last week because U.S. iTunes doesn't seem to display great British reviews. But thanks for the love from across the pond. Also, thanks to Ryan McGill, Keiko18, and Ajax Ashes, who apparently gets our bits and bites all the way down in New Zealand. So, hello to our friends in the Kiwi Island. All over the world this week. Yeah. Yeah, we're going, we're going international. Is New Zealand also considered down under? I believe it is. Okay. Glad we cleared that up. On this week's episode, we're going to go over the results from GP Calgary as well as last weekend's Magic Online Mythic Championship Qualifier, as well as Toby Henke's detailed meta breakdown from GP Bilbao. Then in the dive down, we're talking about Chalice of the Void. Is this the card that will save us from ourselves? You mean like in an existential way? It will keep us from staring into the void? Exactly, or always keep our cups filled with something to drink. Water's important. A a void, plenty of void to go around. Keep us from being faithless, maybe? (laughs) Yeah. Got to believe in something, Dave. Finally, in the wind down, we'll react to the PAX East trailer or the Spark spoilers. A little something for everyone in there. But first, we're going to jump over to Dave, who's handling the breakdown this week. What do you have at the news desk? Beep, 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 beep. Well, the first event that we're going to talk about today is Grand Prix Calgary, which was the normal modern format. Yet another GP. We had like, this is like the fifth GP In like three weeks? It's the fourth one, I believe, in the last three or four, three weeks, I think. And then there was a fifth one a couple of weeks before that as well. So we are getting a lot of GP results these days. I'm loving it. Unfortunately, we're not getting a lot of GP coverage. No. Don't love that. Yeah. But that's okay. You know, I think we're going to get some more coming up soon. Uh, So this week we just had text coverage. So I think that we'll be able to go through this event pretty quick because basically what we did was we kind of kept an eye on on, uh, Channel Fireball's page and then also kept an eye on Twitter to see if what players were saying about the event as they they were getting through it. The first note that we really saw or the only note that we really saw that was any consequence during day one was just a note from Channel Fireball saying... We haven't done a dive into the deep into the numbers quite yet, but the room is filled with fair decks this weekend. Not only is is it Phoenix popular, but variants on Death Shadow, Golgari, Jund, and Blue White have been doing well in these early rounds. Hashtag MTG Calgary. Uh, I thought it was interesting that they decided to go on their own Twitter account and kind of put out a state of the meta, like an anecdotal <laughs> state of the meta tweet halfway through day one, just to let kind of let everybody know how things are going and uh, just just check in with everybody. Good news. These five very traditional decks are doing okay. Yeah. Everything is fine. Everything's stable. In case you were worried. (laughs) Yeah. I think that the most interesting piece of coverage that we got was at the end of day one, getting the day one undefeated decks. Um, So there were three of them. This week's nine O's from the day one, day one of the Grand Prix were humans piloted by Nolan Hanna. Uh, it was a pretty stock build, so nothing that seemed too notable to me as being uh, kind of different. There was a Kessig Malcontents main, which doesn't always happen these days. Sometimes it's there, sometimes mm-hmm. it's not there. Uh, the second deck that went 9-0 on day one was Is It Phoenix, piloted by Andrew Huska. This one was pretty interesting to me in a lot of ways. It felt a lot like uh, we're kind of just continuing to see Is It, Is it Phoenix evolve so this deck, and a number of the decks that I saw over this weekend actually had three Pyromancer Ascension main. Yeah. This particular deck had three Surgical Extractions main, no gut shots. This deck also had no Crackling Drakes, and it had a Jace and a Ral in the sideboard. 
Pyromancer's Ascension seems to be the real, real, real deal these days. I played against it over the weekend with Stan, and it was just brutal. And I played against it online as well, and it's just been unreal. It can really get the deck out of a lot of tight situations that it previously could not get out of. Yeah, I really like Pyromancer's Ascension too. I'm pretty surprised with Jason Ral in in the sideboard, however, because I think Chandra just operates much better than Jace does for four mana in this particular deck. Uh, and Ral is especially a curveball, kind of goes in line with the plan, but it's so expensive that it would seem like a liability in a lot of matchups. Um, I think part of the reason you can cut Chandra in a build like this is because having multiple Pyramanches Ascensions allows you to do things like cast Bolt and have it go out two times. So you don't need to burn them out as much as you do need to control the board to establish Ascension. Yeah, that makes sense. So why was Pyromancer's Ascension not always the inclusion? Like, what do you think is making it become the standard inclusion lately? I can't answer that myself. I think there's a ton of value in doubling up on some of the spells, especially as people are getting more prepared for Phoenix and better at beating it. I think it's a little harder to deal with two spells than one on the stack. That's my first instinct i think it's also a pretty decent two drop especially if you don't have thing in the ice it creates this inevitability engine that's fairly easy to get online so especially with thought scour kind of becoming a mainstay these days i think that's another good two card combo that plays well with with one another i think it's just sort of an evolution of the deck going from being something that was creature combat centric into finding an alternate win con that doesn't necessarily rely on the combat step to finish it so if you can get pyromancer up and you can bolt people a ton then you can get a little bit of extra value out of everything and kind of close out the game a little bit more reliably as well yeah just to piggyback off that with pyromancer online bolt snap bolt does 12 damage yeah <laughs> sure yeah. it sure does and these decks are starting to run uh, snapcasters too yeah though i don't know if andrews did to be honest i think the andrews last list had a single snapcaster main and that was it and the third deck that went 9-0 at uh, GP Calgary day one was uh, Dredge piloted by Tobias Roos. Yeah. Now, I didn't notice anything too notable on this one, but um, Shane, I'm not sure if you had any thoughts. Yeah, the sideboard had some interesting, perhaps unusual choices. Nothing like earth shattering, nothing we haven't seen before, right? But there's some one ofs in there that you need to have in your opener, or at least one of your very early natural draws, or you're gonna have to like natural draw for it later. Like the damping sphere, the surgical extraction, the engineered explosives are all one ofs in the sideboard. I personally am not sure I'd want to run any of those cards in dredge right now just because of the limitation. But you know, this is the guy who made the top eight and I haven't, so Shane, I'm sure you'd make more top eights if you played in more tournaments. Hmm. I believe that he was also 17, by the way, Tobias, Tobias Roos. <laughs> I want to point out something real quick. Engineering Explosives gets around a card we're going to talk about later for Chalice, because you can play it for zero and blow up a Chalice that's on one, because it costs zero when it's on the battlefield. So it's something to consider for later. Great point. Little little preview. that In the industry, we call that a tease, Zach. <laughs> I like it. The last thing I wanted to point out uh, in the day one undefeated decks are the two other players that were playing to be 9-0 in round nine of day one. The first player who ended up 8-1 and one was Sam Pardee on Grix's Death Shadow. And the second player was Benjamin Burke on Blue White Control. So going into the last round of day one of GP Calgary, we had five different decks playing to try to make uh, to make a 9-0, make a perfect first day. And uh, all format staples, all kind of representing different strategies, but it was pretty interesting to see uh, a little bit of diversity there at the top of the metagame, even as it turned out. With that in mind, we can move on to looking at the day two metagame that was shared uh, by Channel Fireball later on Sunday. Uh, day two of Calgary comprised was comprised of 153 players, and the field itself was led by Is It Phoenix... Surprise, Never surprise, at 17.65% of the metagame day two. 27 players were on it. Yeah, that's like 5% less than usual. We're getting somewhere. We're making progress. Yeah, stuff is moving back down. Stan told me the deck is bad now. <laughs> I've been saying this for weeks. Deck's unplayable. <laughs> it's just not very hip. Um, the next bracket of decks, let's say the um, the decks that are kind of above 6% would be Burn at 9.15, Green Tron at 85 Dredge at 6.5 and Griggs' Shadow at 6.5%. So we have our kind of expected tier, other than the fact that I think the burn was pretty overrepresented in this, in yeah. this day two in a, in a lot of ways, especially oh, yeah. given some of the data that we'll talk about later uh, from that channel Fireball shared about burn's win rate. 
Anyone have any thoughts about this top five? Fast red decks are very good right now. I know that's not a particularly big revelation, but going fast and having lightning bolts seems to be winning games. Sure. Are you are you considering Is It Phoenix a fast deck? Yes, I am. Okay. Do we still consider it to be a fast deck, Stan? I don't know. Um, I don't think it's doing the turn three, turn four wins like it used to. I think it's playing a slower game than it did at the beginning of its climb to the top of the format. It's gotten older in age and no longer can move as quick as it once did. It's got to be a wily veteran. <laughs> but besides Phoenix and Burn, I, I mean, Grixis Shadow isn't really a lightning bolt deck. So I don't know if I'm seeing a ton of evidence that bolt decks are really the place to be right now. I was saying because there's 41 decks that are lightning bolt decks. The, the, yeah, the top. Yeah, two. that's fair. That's, yeah, fair. that's fair. That's like 28%. Yeah, I mean, Andredge does run red and is an aggressive deck, but, you know, it, it's lightning bolts just take the form of free lightning helixes. <laughs> Yeah, Dave, keep it running down this list because I think it just gonna we're gonna see kind of what the meta is. Another example of the same meta. Exactly. So if we look at the decks that comprise less than six percent of the field, we start with blue white control at five point eight eight percent, green bl- black mid range at five point two three percent, humans at five point two three percent, amulet titan at three point two seven, hardened scales at three point two seven, spirits at two point six one. And then the other is 26%, and that's everything that's, like, less than four copies. And they particularly mentioned, what, like, Affinity, Bogles, Adnaz, and Titan Shift. Yeah. Had a few pilots. Yeah. I mean, I think it's interesting that the field is still maintaining being the most prevalent deck in the in the metagame. So that that's a positive thing for Modern, I think, in some ways still, is that the other is still the biggest bucket. But it still feels pretty top-heavy here. Yeah. I mean, this is like the meta. Since the the flight of Izzet Phoenix, this is the same stuff we've been seeing in pretty much every list. Like, besides burn, like you mentioned, creeping up, this is a much larger representation of burn than we've seen in, I think, since the entire time since Phoenix has been around. You know, and blue-white control is a little bit more prevalent here, but and prison is missing in the 4-plus percent category at least. But this is like the stabilized meta game. Yeah, I think you're right. The pris- the absence of prison is a big surprise here, though, because you know last week we were talking about how it's the new hot deck. It inspired us to do an episode about Chalice of the Void to talk to people about it, and it's not here in Calgary this time. But at the same time, burn wasn't that present for the last few weeks either. I mean, there wasn't a ton of burn in even the SCG regionals top eight, so that could be a blip and not necessarily evidence that the deck is already dead in the water. No, certainly not just already dead, right? Like these are like the the ebbs and flows of everything that's not is a phoenix. Yeah. So yeah, seeing burn Tron and Dredge as like the two, three, four makes sense to me as to why is a phoenix might lose a little bit of the metagame share because all of those are pretty decent matchups against is a phoenix, and so you know seeing burn creep up a few percent and seeing is a phoenix creep down a few percent, you know, makes sense to me. So. We'll see if this keep, continues to be a trend. Yeah, I I think it's uh we'll we'll see. I mean, burn didn't pre- you know as a little foreshadowing for the top eight. There's no burn decks in the top eight, even given the the prevalence of the of it in the day two field. So why don't we hop ahead and talk about what actually did make the top eight? So the top eight of this tournament, Grand Prix Calgary, was Dredge, Humans, Rock, Is It Phoenix, Blue White Miracles, Grixis Death Shadow, piloted by Sam Pardee. Blue Moon, and Jun Titan Breach. Jun Titan Breach was the winner, and uh, Attila Fur was the pilot of this deck, and he defeated uh, Sam Pardee and Grixis Shadow in the finals. Yeah, Denver local Sam Pardee, not a slouch. I did not realize that he lived in Denver until I started looking at some of his tweets from this weekend. So what do you guys think of this top eight? Well, this winning deck is pretty unusual, combining several different strategies that go well together, but in a somewhat unique way. Yeah, apparently uh, Attila Fur is a scapeshift specialist, known known kind of scapeshift player. Um, I don't think he has any GP wins already, but um, he had tweeted out that he thought that scapeshift was too slow for the meta right now. So he kind of went for what looks like a bit of a, uh, you know, it's a Titan Breach deck. 
that also has a little bit of removal in it in the form of Fatal Push. But the thing that surprised me was that it is running, um, it's running Simeon Spirit Guide to even try to get uh, through the breach out even earlier to just kind of keep ramping, keep ramping, keep ramping. Kind of makes sense coming from someone who thinks they are playing a deck that's too slow otherwise. Yeah. I was really impressed with the Woodfall Primus. Imagine getting yeah, that, love that in card. off through the breach, and then it comes back with just a minus one, minus one counter, and you get rid of two of your opponent's permanents, potentially. That seems pretty amazing. Yeah, I think this deck is really interesting, and I don't know if I would recommend this to somebody. This seems like a pile of cards that someone has poured themselves into, and each card has like a very distinctive cement reason for being in, but this looks like a finely tuned machine. I'm looking at this, and I'm loving it. Oh my goodness. Yeah, it's it's either finely tuned or awesomely random. Yeah, yeah. Well, I it, I want to believe because it won a big tournament. It was the first one, but yeah, maybe they just clicked the random number generator and threw it together. <laughs> I'm gonna say finely tuned since this person is a known player of this type of archetype already. Yeah, yeah. I'm looking at the text on Woodfall Primus because I was not positive about what it gets, but when it enters the battlefield, you destroy target non-creature permanent. So if you're cheating this in off through the breach. At minimum, you're getting rid of two of your opponent's lands. And if you're cheating through the breach out on, like, turn three, that could be a massive play that your opponent may never come back from. You know, we're going to talk a lot about cheating things into play on on this podcast, so uh, I think it's interesting to see people using Simeon Spirit Guide for other things than uh, Chalice, basically. Well, there was a Chalice in the sideboard of this deck, a single copy. Yeah, I mean, we're going to talk about this a little bit later, too, but it seems like Chalice shows up in the sideboard of of uh, primeval titan decks sometimes and i kind of can't figure out why is it just because they have so many expensive spells and chalice doesn't really hurt them yeah and things like uh we'll get into it boggles is a particularly hard matchup for decks like this and a chalice on one just wrecks boggles most of the time so it shores up a really bad matchup and sometimes you can put a chalice on three in a place and that can shut down certain decks as well you also notice that this humans deck has two chalice on the side as well that's wild I mean, Mm -hmm. I feel like if you're playing Chalice with humans and your opponent removes your Aether Vial, you might be screwed because your one and two drops are so vital to your plan. Well, I don't don't think you're casting it on two. Sure, you're probably casting it on one, but then you're never getting Noble Hierarch for one. This this de- this deck is running no nobles. Is why it's interesting. The only thing, the only one drop it has is Champion of the Parish. Everything else is a two drop. That is a very mm-hmm. different take on humans. That's I did not I didn't notice that. That's interesting. Yeah. yeah so you, you you could do a champion on one and then a chalice on one on t- two and then just ride that for a while. Yeah. I mean, chalice of the void does impose real deck building restrictions, even if it's in your sideboard. It just means that they're looking to shade up those is it Phoenix and other matchups so so much that they're willing to give it a try. Yeah. Cool. Well, I mean, some of the other decks that stood out to me in this top eight were the blue moon which was pretty interesting um, to see it pop up every once in a while. Yeah, you Moon players, what do you think makes this deck good or bad in a metagame? Or is it always just sort of constantly lurking in the background? Stan, why don't you ask the other Moon players that are on this podcast? <laughs> moon players, Shane, AKA Stan. Shane, you've cast lots of Snapcaster Mages. <laughs> I cast like two. He's cast them right into buy lists all over America. <laughs> I have only the bought and sold. Buy it back at a higher price. <laughs> I've only bought and sold two play sets. Okay, arbitrage. That's not how. That's not what that word means. <laughs> that's, that's kind of what it means. It's poetic license at the very least. Right. So for me, my success with Moon, I think, has always been pretty consistent with how powerful Blood Moon is in a meta. So if you're dealing with a lot of Cavern of Souls decks, or even players being greedy with their mana base. Having a main deck Blood Moon that you could potentially get on turn three after like a turn two remand can pretty much buy you all the time you need to keep the board super stable. I I like to touch upon the power of Blood Moon right now because I think it's in a very interesting spot. Maybe we could spend a quick minute on that and just talk about maybe the top five deck list or top five archetypes that came up here. Because I think is it Phoenix and Burn? Blood Moon's not great, and sometimes you can get the Phoenix player. Like, if they keep a sketchy hand and they don't have a fetch and you punish them and keep them off blue, that's really great. But for the most part, they don't care, and I will for sure side them out in that match, and same for Burn. It's interesting that the next couple decks, Green Tron, Dredge, and Grix of Shadow, are decks where Blood Moon does really well. So you have two decks at the top of this that are 
bad to don't caring about Blood Moon and other decks that just get wrecked by it. So it's interesting. Yeah. I mean, to answer your question, Shane, what makes Blood Moon to me a little bit more interesting than other control strategies is that it's a little bit faster and more consistent in my mind to Jeskai Control, which is the other bolt-based control deck versus, say, something like Blue White, which I think is super slow. I just I don't see how Blue Moon and Jeskai Control overlap in their strategies. Well, they're just Snapcaster Bolt decks. Yeah, Bolt Snap That's Bolt. all, and, and Blue yeah, Moon is a bigger spells. one. With cryptic commands. Exactly. And so okay. Jeskai is more aggressive and has a more uh, access to better kind of removal suite. Blue Moon has a more kind of like streamlined mana base. Got it, got it, got it. Yeah, I think that's part of it. Um, one of the things that stuck out to me with this particular deck is that it's adding, in addition to two main deck Jace, it has one RAL. Yeah. And, and when RAL was first printed, there was a lot of debate in the small Blue Moon community about whether he was better than Jace and could replace that card so i kind of like seeing this player pretty much split the hair and go both ways and add one of the five drops and keep that four drop jace plan online since having played blue moon i can say that jace wins you so many games you know when you do turn two remand turn three blood moon turn four jace that's christmas land but your opponent just will never win Okay, so that wraps up Grand Prix Calgary. Again, congratulations to the winner, Attila Fur, and uh, thanks for piloting such a spicy deck to the championship. Uh, the next event that we're going to take a look at is the Magic Online MCQ that posted today. So it was, uh, I believe that it was played on Sunday, March 31st. And we're just going to take a quick look at the top eight, just because I think there were a couple of interesting things to talk about here. So the top eight of this this tournament was... Humans, Is It Phoenix, with three main deck Pyromancer Ascension as well, Death Shadow Zoo, Humans Again, Merfolk, Hollow One, Tron, and GDS. Yeah, so we had some stuff come from out from the woodwork for this tournament. We saw I like the I love the Merfolk deck. Like I had to talk about this Merfolk deck because I think the inclusion of the double mist caller in the main deck which is just a single blue mana one drop. It can be sacrificed to exile any non-token creature that would enter the battlefield without being cast. So dredge opponents, is it phoenix opponents, anything you know, like with a vial that wants to vial in a creature. So if a creature wasn't cast, you can sacrifice a mist caller and and nothing's going to enter the battlefield that way. It also gets to run what's like essentially a counter spell with wizard's retort because almost every creature is a wizard. And it has the powerful land disruption and spreading seas. So, I don't know. I mean, I'm not saying Merfolk is, you know, our new Tier 0 or anything like that. But it certainly seems like a, a fun deck for someone experienced playing it. Yeah. Bendic Biomancer seems to be the real deal in my oh, experience. Oh, yeah, it's around. It's around, yeah. yeah. Both in paper and online, the this card is, it seems not that much. And you can undervalue it. But as soon as it gets going, they are drawing lots of cards. And they're swinging for four. And then your land's an island. Yeah. I'll say I'm thrilled to see Wizards Retort in this deck. It's kind of been a long time coming, I think, to to make it up up into modern. But I've been playing, I've played the blue, Mono Blue Tempo deck a bunch of times on Arena because it's a cheap deck to build. And Wizards Retort is just bonkers in a in a to have access to counterspell in, in standard. And so I think that having something that's just kind of a catch all answer for lots of lots of different cards is really great. And you know, Merfolk is in the best position to take advantage of that. You know, Miss Caller has been kind of on people's list as something that was supposed to be good against a lot of kind of cheaty decks in modern. And so it's interesting to see a deck finally get a top eight with that in the main. It makes me wonder or uh, be a little bit more hopeful about how effective a card like Containment Priest could be if it also gets added to the format later. Yeah, that's what I thought of instantly. Miss Caller grabbing a Phoenix seems cool. Not, not an application I ever have thought of until this moment right now. My one very nitpicky thing here is I think you're not casting a ton of wizard retorts on turn two, and that's one of the places where traditional counterspell really shines. This deck only has five one-drop wizards, so your chances of lining that turn one, turn two sequence is pretty low, but I can still see blue-blue counterspell being fairly effective, you know, in the mid to late game, possibly, if, if this deck can even last to the late game. Yeah, it's sort of like protecting you from uh, from Oblivion Stone and stuff like that, more so than it's protecting you from someone's turn two play, like a Manamorphose or something like that, I guess. Right, and maybe you're getting some coverage from their turn two plays with Spreading Seas as well, if you're on, yep. if you're on the play. That makes sense. 
Great. So I think that that's probably all we wanted to talk about on the MCQ top eight. It was nice to see Hollow One kind of come back. Mm-hmm. But most of the other decks on this were pretty stock, but it felt fun to st- uh, stop and talk about Merfolk. I'd like to, at this point, retire us pointing out main deck Pyromancer Ascension as something unusual. And is it Phoenix? It's been going on for a few weeks now. I think we can agree that that card has pretty much earned its place in the deck. Yeah. I think it just signifies that we've entered a different era with that deck. Yes. Uh, yeah. How about the main deck Set Adrift, though, that was in this Is It Phoenix list? I've been seeing more and more of that, and it's very good. It gets yeah. around a lot of issue cards, and once again, with Pyromancer's Ascension, and you get to bounce two things, it's always GG. Yeah. I mean, it lets you bounce a Chalice of the Void, for Yeah, example. I, I didn't want to spoil that one, but it, it certainly is good against that card. Yeah. Should I get Set Adrift for my... Yes, you should. Uh, yeah, not Yes. I'm I bet foil is like a buck. Live a little. <laughs> but then my foil will be all bendy. Oh, Treat yourself. Little, little, yeah. I have a box of cons cards. I can get you a set of drift next time I see you. Yeah, get me some set of drifts. Yeah, they're, they're not running more than one. They're just running one. <laughs> just just give me a couple. Come on. Sure. I'll, on I'll, my desk by Wednesday at noon. I'll please. set you a drift. Great. And then the last thing we want to talk about in the breakdown section is the article that was published by uh, Channel Fireball earlier this week. That was a uh, deeper dive from Toby Hankey into GP Bilbao's uh, metadata. I love how much work this guy's doing. I got to say. Yeah. And this is an incredible amount of work on this single tournament now, because this is a Sam, uh, this article dove into the day one meta of GP Bilbao, which is something you actually don't see very often, or maybe, I don't know if we've ever definitely seen one at a, at a modern grand prix or not, but he managed to get the records for 1600 different decks that were played at Bilbao. I think that he estimates that there were 15, decks he did not get access to so how is he doing this is he i mean he he clearly works for channel fireball and channel fireball has all the information are they just opening up like this pandora's box of data and with you know magic has always been so protective of this stuff yeah well there was a picture on top of the on the top of the article that was just a plastic bag filled with deck sheets deck registry sheets so i think that they're going through and actually tabulating and collating all of the all of the decks that were registered at this particular event, and maybe they're going to do that at others. You know, with people trying to generate um, value off of sort of crowdsourced versions of this data with Mox Insights and thing like things like that, I think that Channel Fireball was finally just like, you know, we have access to this data where the people actually know, and we need to use it because other people are just getting it anyway. So we should be allowed to use it to make content. I wouldn't be surprised if that was the argument they presented. And they're going to get so many clicks on this type of data. They should. Yeah, absolutely. I think the fact that it's missing, you know, what is it, 15 or so people's performance for that day is, it's kind of unusual, but I think it might illuminate sort of what his data collection process was like, since it must have been, they didn't have 15 DCI numbers to maybe look at that person's Planeswalker points histories, assuming uh, CFB isn't just flat out providing that data with him. Because if, yeah. if CFB is just flat out providing this data, why would they be missing those 15 players? Because they lost this the deck. deck list. They've lost the deck sheets. Yeah, I mean, that's or, the simplest reason. They don't put these or, in an electronic database. Uh, okay. Or, <laughs> or, what are they hiding? <laughs> <laughs> Deep state. What are they hiding? Yeah. We're coming for you, CFB. We know you're up to something. <laughs> Release the results. Release the Show me list. the receipts. That's, what, that's all I'm saying. So remember that GP Bilbao was a tournament won by French legend Guillaume Matignon playing, is it Phoenix? Just a nice reminder that this is one of the tournaments on the infamous weekend of the uh, Rise of Phoenix. Um, but here's the percentages of the decks that were above 3% of the field from Bilbao day one. Is it Phoenix was number one with 13.44% of the meta. That means that 215 people registered Is it Phoenix as their deck list on day one going into the tournament on their own. One eighth of the players who came to a Grand Prix, not day two, not taking into account performance, came with Is it Phoenix sleeved up. So we know the day two number, right? Is, is, is it 22% of 100 players from day two were on Is it Phoenix? So we didn't have the day. I don't have the day two number ahead of or in front of me, but it was the combined day two across all those Grand Prix that was around that twenty two percent number. So yeah, and nothing was particularly outstanding. So 
Yeah, so the 13% became about 22%. Well, if you flip a coin enough times, sometimes it'll land on birds. <laughs> sometimes you'll add 10% to your conversion rate, just like that. Yeah, so Stan, I remember you saying that you were like, well, until we know how many people brought the deck to the tournament. This is my Stan impression. <laughs> until you know how many people brought the deck to the tournament, you can't know that how good it is. I, I think I have a stronger Russian accent than that. I mean, yeah, I, I, if you flip a coin enough times, sometimes it'll land on Phoenix. I mean, the fact that there's so many, there's 215 players playing this deck. Obviously, it's going to have a big turnaround when it's the best deck in the format, arguably. Yeah, I mean, it's not. I I do think that adding 10% to the field from day one to day two is a pretty big kind of swing. That's a lot. Yeah. I mean, we can see we can see what the win percentage is just below in the article. Right. So we'll go on to that in a minute. The next tier of decks below that, I'm going to say, are the ones that were above 6%. This means in this field that they were decks that basically had 100 registrations or, or above, essentially. Right around 100, let's say. So the the second most registered deck at GP Bilbao was Burn with eight point three percent. Surprising. There's there's a bunch of Burn in this in this day one meta game again. The Rock had a hundred registrations at six point two five percent. Man, people love their fair decks. Yeah, they really do. Tron had six point one three percent, and Shadow had six point one three percent as well. Both of those had mm. ninety eight registrations, by the way. So they were just shy of a hundred decks. Mm-hmm. Hey, guess what? It's those decks again. <laughs> I've heard of all this. Hey, everyone, it's those decks again. <laughs> I mean, I think this is just more confirmation that those ones, I think that they maintained sort of a steady conversion rate from day one to day two. I think the story gets really interesting when you start to look at people's win rates. Yes. So I'm going to rocket through the rest of this day one meta. So Dredge was after that, and then Humans, both around 4.5%. Blue Eye Control was at 4%. Spirits was close to 4%. Hardened Scales was also close to 4%. And then Red Green Valley Kit was 3%. Another stable metagame, pretty much what we've what we've expected over the last couple, other than Spirits being a little bit higher maybe than we've seen the last couple tournaments. The other interesting thing in Toby's article was a table they po- he posted of the win percentages of all the decks over a certain sample size. It was generally around 250 matches recorded that he included in this breakdown. And the number one and number one deck on this list was War Prison with 61.43%, uh, logging in at 280 matches played. Yep. Makes you think of KCI. They won 172 matches and lost 108 matches. One player. I don't know how that player got that work done in a single tournament, but good work. So uh, I think that given the, especially given the fact that the day one meta had less than 3% were prison, it's fascinating to see it have such, such good performance. And I think that, you know, we've seen over the last couple of weeks that more and more people are bringing this deck. Uh, Ari Lax, among other pros, has sort of promoted this deck as, as the way to go uh, in the format. And so I think we're only going to see more and more of this particular Mox opal flavor of uh, frustration from here. Where? We're only going to see it. Yep. Like, we're. Yeah, like W-H-I-R. I love it. We're. Wait, I don't get it. Why? Uh, World of Invention is like a pretty big card in the deck, so it's a it playoff is? words. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll talk about it in a different dive down. We're not ready for it yet. Let, let's dive into this a little deeper. So sure. if, if there's only what seems like a handful of were prison players and they're seeing an about 60% win rate, that sort of suggests to me that either the deck might be underplayed or it was in the hands of people who have a ton of reps with it and they knew what they were doing. And if the casual Joe Schmo picked it up, they might really struggle with it since it's a, you know, a toolbox controlly deck. This is KCI all over again. It's going to be a deck that people are going to slowly realize how incredibly good it is. And then they'll learn how to play it and then they will pick it up and it will be like the 58% win percentage deck that people are going to hate. Don't you think it's more like Lantern? Yeah. Um, I'm going to say, Please at me for this one. I think that this word deck is incredibly hard to play, harder than KCI. And I think that's why we don't see the representation of other decks, just because how incredibly difficult it is. And you really have to enjoy a very certain kind of Magic the Gathering to play this deck. So it's not that it's not good. It's just it's a constant brain teaser every single game, and you can't slip up. Yeah, Shahar Senhar was on the last episode of MTG Grindcast talking about this deck specifically, and one of his points that I think were really important is that this deck 
really rewards players who understand the format intimately. So the more you understand what your opponent is doing by turn one or two, the faster you can start whipping out some of these tools that you need to really obstruct your opponent's plan as quickly as possible. The second best performing deck on this table was Dredge with 55%. I keep saying this, 55%. Why is Dredge not being played even more than Phoenix? Well, I mean, given that Phoenix was only a less than a percent behind in win percentage at 54.2, I yeah, don't still, really think better. that there's that it's big better. of a difference. <laughs> well, we've, we've, we've seen we've seen previous uh, charts that Toby Hanke has posted where like Phoenix in a different tournament was like a 51% deck, right? Or like a 52% 50, it deck. It was 53 versus 60. Dredge had a 60% <laughs> deck as well. That's pretty, it's a pretty big delta. Yeah. Not in Bilbao, my friend. So I think that we could skip the rest of this this table, there's a ton of decks below 55% down to 50%. The one deck that is a huge surprise to me, or the two decks that are huge surprises to me that I'm going to say really quick, are The Rock at 46.46% win rate and Burn at 45.14%. So, disappointing. I think that the bottom three decks, Jund, Rock, and Burn, which are all less than 47%, I think this is what you can expect to see for most mid-range decks. They're they are at or less than fifty percent. I think, and I think burn might be an issue where maybe newer players, less experienced players, players you audible at the last minute, they're going to bring their burn decks. And burn is a deck that has thin margins. If you are not expert with it, you may not get that. You know, 6% that takes it up to maybe a 51% win rate deck, right? So I think that this is an example of just, you know, there's a lot of players playing it, and some are going to have lower skill levels than, than others, perhaps. Fair enough. There. Does anybody have any other takes they want to they wanna d- give? Amulet Titan? What the heck? Yeah, Hardened Scales and Amulet Titan and even Mono Red Phoenix dropped significantly from their performance at GPLA, which was the last time Toby put together a data set of this caliber. So I thought it was pretty notable that like Amulet Titan is a deck that its pilots love talking about how great it is, and yet yeah. it didn't do so great in Europe. And it wasn't even played by that many people. It's just, I mean, it could have just, like you said, Stan, could have been some bad coin flips, right? But, you know, lots of things you hear in the modern ether is that Amulet Titan is like the best deck in the room no one's playing, but maybe it's not. Guess what? It's War Prison is the best deck in the room that nobody's playing. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Yeah. I also noticed that Hollow One and Affinity saw some pretty notable growth. Uh, Hollow One, like that deck, is super underplayed. It just seemed to totally fall by the wayside after, what, six months in the format? And maybe people should still be playing it if they have the cards. Oh, yeah, it's definitely good. I think it just, it just, it's a type of deck that a certain person wants to pilot through, you know, a nine round tournament or like a, a nine round day one. And so it's, it's definitely. Still good. I think it just other decks may have a similar game plan but be better or just have more resilience. Yeah, maybe you need to have high risk tolerance too because sometimes Hollow One loses to itself. We're talking about Is It Phoenix, right? And decks that are similar but probably better. Yeah, I mean, the the bird that shan't be named. <laughs> the bird that can't be named, David. Don't shant me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that was awesome. That was a really great breakdown from everybody involved. Thank you all. We're going to take a quick break now, and when we return, we are going to dive down into the cuppeth that overrunneth, Chalice of the Void. Stay with us. So guys, I remember the very first time someone cast Chalice of the Void against me. And for the longest time, this person, who was playing Eldrazi Tron at the time, I would constantly get paired up against them. They would constantly cast it against me. And it took me a really long time to figure out how to beat it. And to paint the picture a little bit for you, at the time, I was playing Storm. So this person was just an absolute master with Etron, knew the matchup well. They would cast Chalice on one, and I'd basically have to scoop. Because for the longest time, and this is again before a braid was printed... I just didn't really have an answer until one day I found Shattering Spree, but by then it was already too late and my heart was broken. Shattered, (laughs) you might say. You might. Do you guys remember the first time someone cast Chalice against you? I think what's more interesting than remembering the first time someone cast it against us is I wouldn't hear the first time Zach cast it against someone else. Oh. So I had them in... 
on MTGO before I had them in paper. And this must have been about three years ago. And I bought them because I kept losing the Boggles matchup because Scred is very bad versus Boggles as they have Hexproof. And I am a, you know, a damage-based removal deck. So I shelled out the money to get Chalice of the Void to beat Boggles. And then I queued into it and I got a Chalice on one. And it, it, I think that's the moment I probably became a little bit of a spike in that I no longer followed my heart about something. And I, instead I looked for a very good strategy and sought it out and did it. I'm so glad you got paired up against Bogles pretty fast. Oh, I mean, I grinded. It wasn't the first one. Like I, I, I sought them down. It was a vengeance. <laughs> he had a he had a post up in the tournament practice room that said Bogles players only. <laughs> Bogles only best of one. <laughs> Bogles get at me. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, um, as you could have surmised, we're going to be talking about Chalice of the Void in this dive down. And Chalice of the Void is a very contentious magic card. People love it. People hate it. It draws lots of intense reactions. Yeah, Zach, why do you think it's a good time to be talking about Chalice? I think that, uh, as we've alluded to throughout this episode in the past, Chalice of the Void is particularly well-positioned right now, with there being a lot of one- and two-mana spells in a lot of very big decks. And a lot of these decks rely on these cards, so being able to turn them off can... It won't win you the game on the spot, that's not how the card works, but it will allow you to get in your damage and prevent them from doing what they want to do. Yeah, and we did a little bit of analysis here to kind of talk about what exactly the dimensions of the meta are like in order to explain why Chalice might be good right now. So as we all know, Modern is a format where there's such a huge card pool that the CMC of cards has generally just gotten focused down and down and down. That's always the goal in Modern is to try to figure out how to lower your curve to the point where it's basically all one mana spells or all one and two mana spells. Most decks have many, many, many cards in the one and two mana slots so consider this we went to uh mtg goldfish and looked at their top their format staples for modern and counted the top 50 spells uh, to see how many of them are one cmc and how many of them are two cmc 20 of the top 50 cards played in modern are one cmc 14 of the the rest of the top 50 are two cmc so together it's 34 34 of the cards so it's about 66 percent of the of the modern meta game is made up of one and two mana spells and it doesn't even include the x spells that are frequently cast for one and two cmc correct of which they're like a handful yeah so there's a bunch of of that going on so like zach was saying it does a great job disrupting decks that rely on faithless looting opt scry ancient stirrings chromatic effects like um like tron does specifically the decks that we've seen at the top of the meta recently is a phoenix dredge and tron are all decks that we think chalice is really really good against but there's also a few other decks that it's good against as well including grix's death shadow burn somewhat affinity scales those are things that i'm just i haven't got to play that matchup so i'd be curious to see what zach thinks about chalice against those decks but um it's just really good against a wide swath of the of the metagame zach why don't you tell us what this card actually even does so that the listeners have it in their mind or in their cup (laughs) in their mind cup so chalice is an artifact from original mirrodin it cost xx so two separate x mana cost it enters the battlefield with X charge counters on it, and then whenever a player casts a spell with greater mana cost equal to the number of counters on it, you counter that spell, and that's a triggered ability. So they cast the spell, Chalice sees it and activates, or sees it and triggers. That stupid cup. Yeah. But what does it really do? What is, what is <laughs> it? Why, why is it good? Like, what is it? What does it really make happen? So as I alluded to earlier, it can shut down an opponent's early game or shut down their deck entirely. So if you put a Chalice on one against Phoenix, they are no longer able to dig, they're no longer able to see a bunch of cards, and you have turned off their filtering machine, which really hampers the deck. And as as I alluded to before, Boggles is a deck where a lot of their very important cards are on one, so if you can get a one down before they can get a Boggle down, it's very hard for them to come back from that. Yeah. Yeah, so why, why do you play a Chalice? Like, what is it doing for your strategy while also removing theirs? I play Chalice in Mono Red Prison, and that archetype or that strategy is a little different than the way Word does it. But in this deck, Chalice is looking to buy a little time so you can land an aggressive threat like Gravel Master or Hazaret. So ideally, it's slowing down your opponent, preventing them from removing your threat, and allowing you to win with the, the threat. So the other type of decks that can run Chalice right now are Four Color Prison, also known as Were Prison decks. 
Uh, we see it in a lot of Eldrazi style decks. I mentioned Etron earlier, but Colorless Eldrazi as well as Thalia Stompy, which is a sort of more contemporary take and scaled down version of the Eldrazi and Taxes deck. Bluetron runs it main deck as well. Oh, there you go. Yeah. We also see it in some sideboards, uh, including Amulet. We just mentioned Humans was running it in the sideboards as well. And uh, we saw a Spirits deck last week, didn't we? I'll take your word for it. Yeah, we mentioned the Spirits deck. I saw that from a player at my LGS. Uh, Claire from Dice Dojo was running a build Blue White Spirits with Chalice on the side, and it seemed very good. Wow. Yeah, right. So in a lot of the prison decks we just mentioned, they have ways to get it out quickly. So this is the way you want to play Chalice of the Void for the most part. You want to get it on a counter on one on turn one or a counter on two on turn two very quickly like that. Because like we mentioned, there are so many decks that have a high percentage of one mana spells that you need to cut them off in order to execute your game plan. So some of the common ways that people cheat it into play or accelerate it are Simeon Spirit Guide, Gemstone Cavern, Mox Opal, uh, Rituals as well. Yeah, so the key with this is just that if Chalice is your plan, it looks to us like the decks that run Chalice as their main plan for the most part, or in their main deck, you know, with a couple of exceptions, are trying to cheat it out faster than than Curve. So they use a bunch of cards. They trade card advantage for a little bit of extra mana to be able to play that turn one Chalice on one. Yeah, that does come with some pretty serious deck restrictions, as I alluded to in the breakdown, just because you do have to run cards like this, and they are very bad in the late game. Top decking a Simeon Spirit Guide when you need anything else feels so bad. And Gemstone Cavern's also legendary, so it's extra bad as a top deck. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we're not going to talk about all the decks that run Chalice. In particular, we're not ready to talk about War Prison, mostly because I think it's about $600 online. So we none of us have had a chance to rent it yet, and none of us have Mox Opals. <laughs> My mana trader credit isn't high enough. <laughs> yeah. So I, I don't know if we want to say something about that deck really quick. I guess the thing that we would say is for the, you War Prison players out there, we totally respect the the fact that the, that deck is gaining meta, we just talked about what a great win percentage it has. We're probably going to have to look at that in a future episode. I think right now what we really wanted to do was talk a little bit about the deck, the experiences we've had playing with Chalice, but also give some practical tips on how to play against it. So although I haven't had the chance to pilot War Prison, a good friend of mine has been playing it for months. I've talked to this person about it a lot. Shout out to friend of the show, Martin. And I think what makes War Prison a little different from some of the other decks we talk about is that is a toolbox deck. So it's not necessarily running for prison main. It's not necessarily part of their game one plan. Rather, they might be fetching Chalice with a War pris or with a War of Invention in order to deal with whatever opponent they're up against. Yeah. For the most part, the other decks we're going to talk about today are running a lot of up to four Chalice in the main because it's a big part of their plan. Yeah, I will say a lot of the lists that I looked at for when we were putting together these show notes in War Prison, they are running for Chalice Main oh, now. My mistake. But I agree with you that I do think it's kind of a toolbox vibe. I think occasionally they're okay with cheating it out on turn one, but they're not as trying as hard to as Re Mono Red Prison is or Thalia Stompy or um, Etron even was. Mm hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that really has to do with the lack of creatures that they run, because uh, Chalice in Mono Red Prison is often used as a way to protect cre uh, your creatures. From removal? Exactly. Yeah. So why don't you talk a little bit about red, how it fits into Red Prison, just kind of top level, and about how much you've been enjoying playing Prison lately. Yeah, yeah. I'll do a quick run through through it. So in Red Prison, it's a, a little more proactive than the War Build is. World Build is looking to lock you out and slowly grind you out while the red deck needs to ding you for two damage with things like Eidolon and Chandra and other cards. So it locks you out, but it's quickly applying pressure because the lock is more easily broken as you cannot tutor things out or get cards on demand. So you're looking to do things like on turn one, play a Blood Moon. On turn one, play a Chalice. On turn one, play a Goblin Rabble Master. And the whole thing is you need to think about the deck your opponent's on and think about the best way to establish your lock against them and what that lock looks like against them. Yeah. So it's interesting, the deck that I've been playing that has Chalice in it is, is a little bit of a mirror reflection of kind of what you're talking about, Zach, which is trying to find payoffs for being able to cheat a two-mana card into play on turn one. And so right. the deck I've been playing lately is the deck that last week we incorrectly referred to as Eldrazian Taxes with Chalices, um, the deck that it sounds like most people actually call Thalia Stompy, designed or popularized by the streamer Spider Space who is a consistent performer on Magic Online in the challenges and in, in uh, competitive leagues 
leagues with kind of different variations of this strategy. Yeah, Spider Space has been putting up results with decks like this for, it seems, like years. And they were there even before it was called Thalia Stompy, when it was still called Eldrazi and Taxes. Yeah. But they may have been instrumental in the latest evolution of the deck as well. And I think it's funny that we talked about this deck so much on, on last week's episode and just kind of like totally spaced on the fact that this was the, the Spider Space deck, essentially. Yeah, we Spider Spaced on yeah, it. Yeah, we did Spider Space on it. Um, but I've been having a, a lot of fun playing that deck. And it's a similar thing to... It's interesting because I'd never thought of Mono Red Prison the way that you just described it, Zach, which was like turn one Blood Moon, turn one uh, Rabble Master, or turn one Chalice are all good outcomes for that deck. Yeah, it, absolutely. In the white deck, it's kind of similar, although you're looking at cards like putting a Thalia into play on turn one against a deck that makes sense. Of course, putting a Chalice on one into play, putting a Leon and Arbiter into play on, on turn one, which has actually turned out to be a much stronger play than I thought it was going to be. That's often something where... You know, I'll keep a hand in the dark if I don't know who I'm playing in game one. If I have a way to put Leon and Arbiter in play on turn one, I'll just drop it. Oh, yeah. Especially right. if I'm on the play and say, do you have fetch lands? I hope you're not on burn. And I get, have gotten a couple of actual concessions on turn oh, two yeah. on, on Magic Online just from people kind of snap conceding to it. Oh, yeah. But the thing is, it kind of fits into these decks that are trying to get lock wins off of cards that just totally decimate someone's strategy and are using resources to cheat those those cards into play so chalice is really powerful because of kind of the outcomes that we just talked about but it's also hard to play with and so we have some pointers that we'd like to kind of give people on how to think about how to play with their chalice and tips for just remembering stuff that you need to do when you're playing with chalice and then after that we're going to talk about a few ways to to kind of beat chalice that is uh in unobvious maybe the first time that you read it so the first thing that we're going to talk about for a second is you know we were just talking about how cheating chalice into play is really kind of paramount into making it making it work well but it's not really the only thing the only outcome that you're looking for with chalice right yeah so obviously a chalice on one on turn one is the dream and like we said it's just have so many decks but there will be games where you can't cast it uh right away on turn one and you might have to wait till turn two so it really, you, the only risk there is hand disruption and that they might strip it from you, but most of the time it's going to have to be fine and it is fine ultimately. So it's not great if they can get their one boggle down and then start playing two mana enchantments. It's not great if they don't even have that many things on one, like there's a few issues with it, but for the most part, as long as you can get it down within those first two turns, you are good. I think the diminishing returns increase exponentially afterwards. So what do you think about mulliganing to try to get a, a chalice on turn one to happen? Is that not like uh, is that not really part of the plan? Do you think it's it's not that powerful enough where you feel like you have to do that? So that's a really, really hard one and something that I still struggle with and have issues with. I think it so intensely depends on the matchup. Because like we keep mentioning, there are these decks where putting it on one will blow them out of the water, and you're so far ahead. But if you're playing something like Control, where you are shutting off some filter things but not anything else, I don't know if I'm aggressively mulliganing for it. Yeah. I think the other thing that's interesting is that Chalice on one is, is really powerful and easy to do. Chalice on two can actually be pretty hard to cast because you have to get up to four mana. And so it's a couple yeah. of turns later or a couple of pieces of kind of disposable acceleration that kind of gets you there. So you have to really decide when you're in a matchup where you want to play it on two. Yeah, because you might find yourself in a situation where you've run out of cards to cast and then you've slowed down your opponent a bit, but they catch up at the same rate that you're really just casting your own spells. So the tempo advantage that you're trying to get off Chalice of the Void may be lost if you use too many resources to cast it. So this really ties in to a bigger idea of when you're playing a Chalice of the Void deck, you have to be able to peg your opponent on an archetype within the first two turns, really, because that determines what number to put Chalice on and how good it's going to be. So when you see an opponent play a land, if you haven't already run out of Chalice, you need to think about if you have to hold it, like like we said, for the natural turn two on one, you have to think about if maybe one's not good enough, I have to hold this till I can get it on two. And other things like that, you have to be thinking a few steps ahead, because if you get it down too early or too late, a card that should be immensely powerful for you is now weakened because of your own flat-footedness. Zach, can you give me some examples of, of like decks you'd want to play a Chalice on two against, and how you try to identify uh, that they're on a strategy like that? Yeah, so that's it's one of those things that just comes down to knowing the meta and knowing what lands represent certain decks. So if I see someone lead on a Steam Vents Tapped, 
my mind instantly going, this person's either on Blue Moon, this person's on Storm, or this person's on Phoenix. And against Phoenix, Chalice on 1 is very good, but Chalice on 2 might be better versus Storm or Phoenix because it cuts them off of their Rituals and uh, Mana Morphos. So you then have to look at your hand to consider, all right, is it that important that I'm able to cut them off on 1? Or if I have two more turns, can I just totally cut them off from two mana spells and maybe take the game? Yeah, and some of that math gets different post-board too. Exactly. There is this one example where I'm playing against Zach, my co-host, at our LGS... And him being the master of prison, he cast Chalice on two against me, knowing that all I'm doing is casting a braid to try to deal with artifacts. So sometimes you can shut off your opponent's sideboard plans and hate cards with your Chalice as well. So I thought I thought it was interesting, Shane, that uh, you had noted here that it feels like Rock would be a uh, deck that you would want to play Chalice on two against. I'm not sure if you're really trying to shut down people's creatures with Chalice, or if you're really trying to shut down whatever disruption or filtering or kind of powerful spells that they have. I'm not what do you think about that, Zach? I personally would put it on two if I could. Their one mana suite is mostly hand disruption or fatal push removal. And mm-hmm. if you have a chalice down, you're probably not too worried about hand disruption. And if they fatal push your goblin, so be it, just because you're cutting them off of Bob, most likely, you're cutting them off of Scavenging Ooze, you're cutting them off of Tarmogoyf, so they have to then get to the three mana slot to do anything, and it, you're buying yourself that time. That also cuts them off of Assassin's Trophy and Abrupt Decay as well, which are the two cards that are main deck that actually killed Chalice. Well, it doesn't cut them off from Abrupt Decay, because Abrupt Decay can't be countered. Good point. That's That ties into a different point that we have coming up after this. So yes. one deck that I think is sort of counterintuitive that I believe I would put Chalice on two against after playing a couple of matches now is uh, Burn. Yeah, I would agree with that. Because, really? yeah, and here's why. It's three cards that are, are pretty bad here. Uh, Searing Blaze, Boros Charm, and um, Lightning, Lightning Helix. Helix. Now, the reason is honestly mostly tied to Searing Blaze more than anything else because, and maybe it's different with a mono red deck, but in playing the Thalia Stompy deck, I have so many X2s that letting them be able to two for one me essentially with searing blaze was actually i think much worse than letting them uh lava spike me and occasionally lightning bolt one of my guys without hitting me as well with uh, with the one drops so thinking about it from the thalia stompy perspective you do run a fair amount of two drops so that's an example where you need to be really careful with how you sequence your chalice of the void because if you're putting it down with two counters and all you're holding is a Thalia or a Lean and Arbiter in your hand, you might be in for a world of hurt again. Yeah. You just played yourself. Yeah. There's almost right. no way that deck doesn't just play that on one, right? I think Thalia Stompy generally wants to do it on one and deal with the two drops yeah. by other means. It's- yeah. I, yeah, but the problem is what, what I've had. So I've lost a burn two times with, with, Thal- with Thalia Stompy in leagues, and it's really come down to... I keep them from playing their one mana spells, but they just burn me out with with everything else because they can kill my creatures and also mm-hmm. and also drop me. So I think that there's there's some play there. I mean, you have a good point with the sequencing stand, but I, I think that trying to protect things from Searing Blaze is just so good in that matchup that I think there if you can find a creative way to make it work, you have to try to. Sure. I have two thoughts on that. Uh, one in regards to Thalia stomping wanting it on a one over two. I think I agree, and a big portion of that is the taxing effect of Thalia. A lot of the two mana spells I mentioned Chalice shutting off and being happy about were rituals or card filtering effects, and making those cost one more really does mess with that game plan pretty bad. Yeah. I mean, I, I didn't find that I've had a lot of games where I have Chalice and Thalia in play. I okay. tends, It tends to feel like I have... Um, Leon and Arbiter. I, I guess you know it's. I'm being a little anecdotal by saying it doesn't feel like I ended up with those <laughs> cards together, but it feels like there's kind of like Chalice games where I kind of ramp into Thought Knots, uh, Seer and and uh, Reality Smasher, or there's Leon and Arbiter and and Thalia games where I kind of play my low drops, disrupt them that way, and then attack. And it it hasn't felt like they've the game plans have sort of gone together too naturally. But again, I've only played two leagues with it so far, so I, I gotta think that there's probably plenty of games where you end up with different pieces of hate together in play. Yeah, I think it's just kind of like a redundancy thing, right? Like, I can hate people out this way, or I can hate people out that way. Right. And sometimes they overlap better than others. 
and I have a follow up for what to put Chalice on and Burn as well. So I agree that I think two is better, and this is coming from the Mono Red Prison perspective where you run Ensnaring Bridge. So Ensnaring Bridge is able to take care of all their one drop creatures. You don't need to worry about that. And I, I'm saying this from experience. I put it on one a lot and found that they already had their creatures out and it did not matter. And they just then dumped their handful of two mana burn spells. Yeah. So in this particular deck where you already have sweepers and answers, answers to creatures, it's better to do that and try to stop them from getting in their four damage spells. Yeah, I guess the only other reason I want to mention why putting it on two against burn is it also gets your Eidolon of the Great Revel. Mm. That's a good point. Thank you. So, as someone who's been playing with a lot of Chalice lately, it's something that is very important to remember when you're playing in paper, is that when you are playing Chalice, it is your responsibility to remember the trigger. So, if you cast a one-mana spell into Chalice and try to like get it past your opponent, you can't do that. That's cheating. That's a game's role violation. It is your job to remember your, your Chalice trigger, so just be on top of it. But... And this is where it gets a little maybe hazy, is it's not a two-way street with that. So your opponent can try to cast things through your chalice, and you have to remember. Mm-hmm. It's just like an Eidolon trigger, right? Exactly. You literally have to say, no, that's ca- that's countered by chalice's triggered ability. Yeah, I've learned to point to it with the end of my pen and go, uh, chalice trigger, just to make it a little smoother for me and instead of, uh, excuse me, sir, no. Yeah. <laughs> tap, tap, tap. <laughs> You yeah. get out your pointing stick. Yeah, I did. This card. <laughs> Man, that is tilting. Don't tap your pen at me. You should just prop it up like a little like easel. <laughs> <laughs> um, sir. <laughs> Chalice rules are in effect. Yeah, exactly. So just be mindful of it. Don't You can't cast your own cards through it, and don't let your opponent cast any through either. Because if you don't catch them, it resolves. That's how that card works. Yeah. And we have to practice mindfulness. Yeah. But Zach, even if you were trying to cast the card into the chalice and hope it resolves, you're still allowed to do that, right? Like you can you can play the card, you can cast the card. Yeah, so but chalice just like counters them, right? Yeah, absolutely. And this is an interaction that didn't come up as much as it used to, but now is much more relevant, and we'll get into that in a second. So chalice doesn't prevent you from playing the card. When it's used correctly, the card is cast and then countered. So this matters for things like Thing in the Ice and Arc Light Phoenix, who care about cast triggers, not when you play cards. Right. Sure. Or if you cast a Chalice on 10, I can still cast my Ulamog. Fine. Fine, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) I don't think I've ever done that. (laughs) Nailed it. So this is actually one of the biggest tips that helps you play against Chalice as well, is remembering that... I've played against it a couple of times where I've just sat there and been like, well, I can't play spells that are on 2... Right now, and then I remember, oh, but this spell does something that keeps me, makes Chalice ineffective. And so that's something to remember when you actually are playing against it. So I think this is a good segue for us to look at kind of the ways that you can get around Chalice if someone's played one against you. We talked about Chalice and how to correctly utilize it against some of the bigger decks in the meta and the advantages of one versus two versus certain decks. So we're now going to talk about some ways that you can deal with Chalice and some particularly good cards for that. Yeah, I think the number one thing to remember if if you're going to play against Chalice is that if you see a lot of Chalice decks or you're expecting a lot of Chalice decks, you need to diversify this, the converted uh, mana cost of the artifact removal that you have in your deck. So the example I have of this is that, you know, I like I said, I've taken it through a couple of leagues online and it's been, Chalice has been kind of a stone lock against um, against Dredge, basically, because even yeah. if they try to bring in artifact removal, they often only have nature's claim. Right. And so if I drop a Chalice on one, they're just dead to Faithless Looting is gone and nature's claim is also gone. And then that also clears the way for me to bra- play even stronger hate cards against them like Rest in Peace. So I've had multiple games against Dredge where I've gone turn one Chalice, turn two Rest in Peace and like snap concede from the from my opponent because I can't do anything. Yeah, that seems a, a little aggressive of a concession on their part because you know they still could have a miser's copy of abrupt decay, abrupt decay, or assassin's trophy, and also um, they're going to probably have ancient grudge. Maybe they didn't see an artifact game one, and ancient grudge is a two CMC card. I made the mistake very recently, even as a person who's you know has years of magic under their belt, of forgetting that even the flashback cost, although in your case with Rest in Peace out, it wouldn't matter. Right. The flashback cost of uh, Ancient Grudge is still 2 CMC. Right. It's right. not 1, even though it only costs 1. So I think that I actually misplayed a game and punted a game away by forgetting that I could kill a Chalice on 1 with an Ancient Grudge that was in my yard. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's particularly bad if you if it's in the yard already. 
Oh, yeah, it was very bad. It was yeah. extremely bad yeah. play. <laughs> Shane bad at magic. I just assumed that the p- people that I was playing against either didn't want to wait and try to draw their two, two CMC yeah. piece, or they actually were playing a deck that just didn't have it. I mean, when you're, gr- when you're grinding on Moto, sometimes you don't want to draw to, like, your 1%. Sure. So I think we can agree that as a rule of thumb, two CMC mana spells are good against Chalice because most decks are trying to play them on one. I think that a little bit of a tech grade here, a, a one mana card that is very good against Chalice is the card Shattering Spree. Yeah. So that's a one red mana sorcery that reads a straight target artifact, but it has a replicate cost of one red. So when you cast this spell, you can pay R multiple times and you copy it for each time you paid R. So you choose new targets for the copies. So why this works is when you cast it, the initial casted copy is countered because it was cast. But the other ones are copied, therefore never cast, therefore Chalice doesn't see them. Right. I do want to say here that Shattering Spree, although it's technically one CMC, you're almost never casting it for just one mana. Because nowadays that card is most effective against Chalice decks since you have cleaner or at least more versatile artifact removal in your red base strategies. Yeah, the, the actual, the or the mana you're paying for, it's often more than one, but it can be cast for one. Not through a Chalice on one, but it does have that utility as well. That's true. Zach, let's say that there's a lot of Chalice decks in someone's local meta, and they're going to be seeing it on one and then quickly on two, so that their one and two mana spells that can kill artifacts um, aren't going to be very good. What do you think are the three CMC or higher cards that are most runnable either in the main deck or the sideboard that you can suggest to people to for getting rid of chalice yeah for bouncing or removing a chalice yeah i i think the only one that really comes to mind as playable for this is kolgon's command and i've been blown out by that card many a time i think it's very powerful against chalice decks grix's death shadow which we'll get which we've mentioned or maybe have alluded to that chalice is very very good against kolgon's command just blows you right out of the water yeah by the way they don't really run kolgon's command main deck at this point no <laughs> i've seen it at the sideboard level. quite a bit though so it's sometimes you still get through it i i'd say that there's a couple other cards i would throw in here that are notable i mean cryptic command is something sure. that bounces it set adrift yeah. bounces chalice um there's also the last card that i was just thinking of was oblivion stone you know actually i think chalice is pretty good against tron you know but it only buys you that's probably the deck where chalice buys you the least time in some ways because they can naturally make their way to oblivion stone before you kill them and then that just gets rid of chalice itself too yeah like we talked about last week you just make those drops yeah yeah you make those drops but also you know the reason chalice is good is for the same thing that we talked about last week with tron which is it turns off the prismatic effects it turns off ancient stirrings and things things like that so it does give you a good amount of advantage and oh um, certainly yes personally you know i've i've played against tron a couple of times with with that deck and and won both times mostly because i turned off their prismatics chromatics sorry chromatics (laughs) yeah the secret the secret glue that holds all together yeah I think also having a deck with Blood Moon makes that Chalice on one extra, extra good because you get it on one, they're not making green mana, and then they're having to slowly ramp into their stuff the extra slow way. So I do want to double back to talk about one thing that we sort of branched off of there, which is you know the fact that Replicate is a rule that kind of makes Chalice not see it. There's a bunch of other cards with rules that similarly make Chalice not see it or not effective. Um, Mm. such as another one that we've talked about a bunch of times, uh, today is, um, abrupt decay, right? Oh yeah. Right. So, so abrupt decay is particularly good because the CMC of chalice when it's not on the stack is zero. So if sure hits it and then abrupt decay can't be countered. So even if they have a chalice on two chalice will trigger and, and try to counter it, but nope, can't be countered trigger gone destroyed. Yeah. This has to be why we're seeing more of abrupt decay in the black green, type lists you know we've seen some obs on lists p- popping up with running no main deck trophy but having you know two uh abrupt decay i'm sure that's probably in response to you know both control decks which are never really easy to beat for mid-range decks but also of course chalice being far more frequent than usual yeah uh, i think that black green is a particularly hard matchup for a lot of chalice decks as well so being able to hedge it out even that more in your favor is just extra powerful I think Hercules Recall is also very good. Uh, that's very good against these sort of decks in general. Aside from the Thalia, both the a lot of the other decks are running tons of artifacts, including the Mono Red Prison and uh, Blue Tron and Aldrazi Tron. So being able to bounce 
maybe two chalices and some other mana rocks is particularly powerful. Yeah. I mean, her core's recall it still isn't going to get around chalice on two, right? That's no. just another one of your two mana answers that might also be good against other players in the format. Yeah, it, it could also hit a chalice on zero or three. I know I'm being pedantic, but that matters. Mm-hmm. Zach, I just thought of a random question. So if Thalia is out and I have to add a mana to cast my non-creature spells... And, like, that doesn't get around the chalice, correct? Because the CMC is just always the upper right corner of the card. Yeah, it doesn't change the actual casting cost. You're paying more, but that doesn't change what's actually printed on the card. But if you were to cast your chalice into a Thalia, you just have to add one mana. So, like, a chalice on one instead of costing two would cost three, right? Yeah, right. It wouldn't cost four. I've seen people make that mistake in person before where they thought it would take me four mana to put a chalice on one. It's just one extra. Okay, got it. So Chalice has a lot of really fringe and weird rule interactions. Another one of them is the split second mechanic from the Time Sparrow block doesn't prevent Chalice from countering it. So split second, the ability reads, as long as this spell is on the stack, players can't cast spells or activate abilities that aren't mana abilities. So you would think that this would stop it, but Chalice is a triggered ability, and it does not stop triggered abilities. So you can't cast any spells Mm. in response to split second, but Chalice still triggers and counters it. There's not a ton of split second cards, but it's something to keep in mind because you can blow someone out or get blown out if you're not aware of that interaction. Hey, I have another interaction to ask you about that's kind of weird. Sure. Does a chalice on zero stop cards that have been suspended? The the ones you mean the ones that don't have a, a don't have a mana cost? CMC, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Chalice on zero is particularly good against Living End for that reason. That's wild. Yeah, because yeah, yeah. The, especially the new version or the Restore Balance one where they are using the. Uh, as foretold. So these decks that are using as foretold are particularly blown out because they can no longer just dump their hand to get free stuff. It's countered. And of course, people I've seen people try to play it into my chalice and get me, but just tap, tap, no, no. <laughs> <Nuh-uh-uh>. <laughs> just tap, tap, no, no, guys. So yeah, it, it's, uh, it's always the number that's printed in the corner. And if there's not a number, it's considered zero for this purposes. Likewise, if the spell has XX written in the corner... The CMC does change while that spell is on the stack, but in theory, depending on what you're playing against, you could get someone who's trying to cast an EE for two or an EE for zero. Yeah, exactly. So uh, something like that, a walking ballista, where you're casting it where X equals one, it's actually two on the stack because it's X plus X. So you can't cast a walking ballista on one with a chalice on two. Yeah, I think it's just an interesting rule for people to understand. And actually, you know, we were just talking about this in our chat this weekend. And just understanding what CMC is can be challenging sometimes. So let's say you flash back a conflagrate, right? And you discard five cards from your hand. What's the CMC of your conflagrate? Well, in the way it's written, it's X, X, and then a single red. So you would do X equals five x equals 5, and then add the red for the real casting cost in the upper right. So the CMC is actually 11, because you have to add those two x's together. So it's kind of not necessarily easy to understand right away, but if you just keep looking at the upper right and think about it in that way, you're going to have a much better grasp than thinking about, oh, I'm flashing it back. Is that different? You know, there's a Thalia on the battlefield. Is it adding another mana? No, it's always just in the upper right. Yeah. That one blew my mind. Yeah, right? In particular, because I did not think that discarding, like using an alternate casting cost, would make the CMC populate in the upper right-hand corner, basically. Yeah. Because it's basically like, well, you're not really spending mana on this. You're using a different way to figure out what X is. And lo and behold... It would have to read something like discard Y cards for for it to be a different (laughs) thing. Seriously, because X has to be the same everywhere on the card. It's the same thing. So it would have to have a cost where it's discard Y cards that deals Y damage target thing. Yeah, totally fascinating. And someone else pointed out in our chat that in Treat the Angels, like miracle effects are similar in that way too. So there's your pro tip. Great. Zach, any closing thoughts about Chalice? I love this card so much, and it's really difficult to play with. So I think I have some scenarios to run by you guys, some questions, and I just want to see how you answer them and how you'd respond to them. You have a pop quiz for us? Yeah, a little bit of a pop quiz. Open-ended, it's constructed. We're one of those schools where you give yourself your own grade. Play along at home as you listen to our pop quiz on the radio. Perfect. Here's a scenario for you guys, right? All right. You're playing a deck with Chalice, and your opponent's on the play. They start on a Bloodstained Mire... They don't crack it. 
So off the bat, what decks are you trying to narrow them down to? <sighs> Probably Death Shadow is my first guess. It's Grixis, Death Shadow, Burn, um, Jund, Hollow One. Those are probably the ones that come to mind for me. See, I'm I can't imagine I can't imagine a Hollow One playing just an un, an, an untapped fetch and passing. I, yeah, I, they would want to play a turn one play like a Faithless Looting or a Flame Blade Adept. Um, burn, I think Burn is very. They likely. want to turn one play too, but they want to turn one play too almost every time. I mean, time, they right? typically do, but right, but like maybe they mold or something like that, and they can just like they can fetch and then burn, you know, burn something or burn you or something like that. But they almost want a sorcery speed turn one play like a creature or a or a Rift Bolt or something like that, right? You know, a green black deck seems likely to me. Maybe they did, didn't draw their turn one hand disruption, so they're just waiting to fetch into a tapped shock to save their life. I mean, besides Death Shadow, um, maybe well, Death the... Shadow has eight hand disruption spells. Eh, Seven, they have six. usually. There's... I think, and it's actually going down a little bit too. Yeah, yeah nowadays six. they only have two Kozilek Inquisition or Inquisition. Really, like four Raven's Crime these days. Yeah, that's the other one I was thinking. Maybe it's uh, maybe it's eight, eight rack, rack. <laughs> and they didn't have their turn one hand disruption. They're just holding up wrench mind. Oh, we we can go on this road for a while. <laughs> yes. So we so from an opponent playing a fetch and not cracking it, we've been able to narrow it down to a few decks, right? Right. So on your turn, you have the ability to play a chalice on one. Do you do it? Yes. Hmm. I'm going for it. Yeah, I would go for it in game one. Yeah, game one, it just seems like the right idea, right? I mean, there's 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 more one CMC than two CMC cards in the format altogether. Yeah, well, let's think even specifically about the decks we narrowed it down to, right? Yeah. Sure. So we think it's lately Grace's Death Shadow or Phoenix, correct? Yeah. Or maybe Hollow One. Yeah. Sure. Burn. So how, are these decks mostly centered at one CMC or two CMC? One. Yeah, right. One. So I I think in this scenario it's correct to run it out on one, and then if you can't get punished. They could just be on, you know, like Gorio's Vengeance or something. But even then, I guess one gets them. Yeah, I guess yeah, they're I definitely. Suiting. Yeah, I got them on. I got Gorio's Vengeance over the weekend with with it too. Right. So the likelihood that you're going to be punished is low, and then if you are, you know for the other two games. Yep. So I I think that really illustrates how you have to zoom in right away in what decks and figure out if it's worth dumping your resources right away or trying to conserve. Mm hmm. Here's my worry. My, my main worry in this meta right now would be Dredge casting a Cathartic Reunion on two. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Although, I'm, not saying, I'm, I'm just throwing that out there. I've popped it off in, on turn one against Dredge a couple of times and kept them off Faithless Looting. That was plenty good. Yeah, I mean, yeah but they but, probably would have cast that turn one, though, is what I'm saying. Mm, that is a problem. So they're probably holding a Cathartic Reunion to cast on turn two to get the whole engine going. Yeah, yeah, but on the flip side, getting Chalice on two is very hard for decks without rituals. So if Dredge is casting that card, even Chalice on one on your like you going first Chalice on one isn't gonna stop it. So this one's a little more specific and might be a shorter question, but I think it still is a, a good question for our listeners to hear as well. So you're playing against Death Shadow, and you haven't seen your Chalice all game. They have a single Shadow. They cast two Bolts and two Thought Scours, so they've cast five one CMC spells. Finally, you rip your chalice from the top. You can put it on any number from zero to three. What are you choosing and why? Ding. I'm putting it on two to shut off their team or battle rage. Because mm. it seems like that's probably their biggest win condition at this point. What about just casting more death shadows, though? That seems bad. Yeah. I'm putting it on one to stop uh, stubborn denial if I can. Now, if they already have stubborn denial, they're just going to counter it, but at least I got the stubborn denial out of their hand. Yeah, I just feel like the the concentration of single CMC spells in Death Shadow, because it's like the Turbo Xerox style deck, I just feel like you have to play to your percentages here, and it just seems more correct to kill more cards in their hand and off the top of their deck. And I'm just going to be okay if they call against K Command Me. Right, you can't do anything about that. So a follow-up question. Does your number change if they have a second shadow? And does it change if instead of a shadow, they have a delve threat in play? Hmm. I, th I think if they have their second shadow, it reduces the odds that they'll find number three and four. I still stand by putting it on two because team or battle rage is such a blowout. I guess it depends on the rest of your hand, right? Or the rest of the, of the battlefield. Like, do you have a, ways to either immediately remove or chump block or do something to their death shadows? 
I know I'm asking for more specifics here, but I'm just kind of right. Th- thinking yeah, out, in, thinking in this scenario, it would be no. I'm I'm just trying to illustrate right here how you have to think about all these micro decisions and think about the way that you're going to prevent them from how much work is Charles putting in and how is it putting in for you? I just can't imagine the clock being drastically different with a team or battle rage or not like what it's going to maybe buy you one more turn. Um, but I don't know what they're going to cast on one. That's going to advance their clock any faster than it already is besides lightning bolt, which is pretty slim in the deck right now. Dave, what do you think? I still like it on one to turn off counter spells and, yeah, and yeah. turn off serum vision, serum visions and yeah. that kind of stuff. Yeah. It doesn't, it doesn't let them dig through their deck anymore and like cast a faithless looting or cast their, you know, serum visions. Like you said, thought scour. Right. So let's try to maybe extend the, the point where you're saying and bring that out a little bit. Are you saying that when you have a chalice and you're playing with the deck that has such a high concentrated number of spells, even if they've already cast a bunch of them, it's still worth it to play to keep them from casting more of them? It's like virtual card advantage. Yeah. I think if you're going for just exactly virtual card advantage off of it, then then yeah. there There's what, 25 different spells in Grixis Death Shadow that are single if not mana. more, yeah. Yeah, and uh, I think the question does come down to if you want to try to keep them off of Team or Battle Rage because you're just going to die to it, if if that would save you, like Shane said, then maybe I would do too, but mostly I would try to keep them from, from cantripping through their deck or having Counterspell in case I drew Dismember or something else like that like that I like from my deck. Yeah, that's another reason why knowing the meta and knowing what stock lists typically run is so important. Because if you can look at their deck and see they haven't played that team or battle rage and sort of figure out what's going on and you know and you know that a deck like that runs it, that could be a big difference. So I have a another question for you, and this is about a game two and three scenario. So your opponent's playing an Aether Vial deck, and these are games two and three. So yeah. you're sideboarding. Do you take out Chalice because Aether Vial gets through it and you try to bring in more relevant hate, or do you try to get them with Chalice still? I guess it depends on the concentration of really low CMC spells. Like with, with Merfolk, for example, I think they have a lot of two CMC, but the Lords are three, right? Right. Oh, no, some Lords are two as well. Okay. But with something like Humans, they have a really high density of two CMC spells. So they would have to get to the Vial being out and played, and then they could start going around your, let's say, a Chalice on two. I don't mind keeping a chalice in against humans specifically and i just want to talk about humans because that's the deck i have most experience playing against i haven't actually dealt with spirits or merfolk very often but one of the things that makes that deck strong is that they barf out their hand quickly so they're both activating aether vial and casting an extra spell per turn so being able to prevent them from casting one of those spells could be a big game for the chalice player however I might still take out one chalice because it can be a liability. So I don't know if I want to shave all of them in almost any matchup, um, but uh, that seems like a matchup where you, or Aether Valdex, maybe a matchup where you take out one or two. Zach, do you think that the Vial player is so afraid of chalice on one that they would take out their vials? No, no way. Because if they can get it down before, it's it's so good. I think what's more likely is they bring in strange, um, like we mentioned, maybe strange or unconventional hate to try to take out your chalice. Okay. Yeah, I guess it depends on the deck, right? Like, I'm just looking at a human's list right now, and there's the density of two is just so high. But, like, then that requires you, what, when do you typically play a chalice on two? Turn three? Three, yeah. Yeah, sometimes turn two in red with the, with a very good hand, but that's not the most likely scenario. What would you do, Zach? So... I am by no means a master of Chalice, so don't take this as any sort of firm thing, but I personally take them out, especially against decks like that, because I have found that Vile is so good, and decks like this, you can't get Chalice on a meaningful number soon enough to stop that early tempo. So I would rather take out that and bring in a board wipe or bring in other hate than try to play that game with them, especially if they think I'm going to try to play that game with them. So if they bring in a bunch of weird artifact hate for Chalice and then they're gone, you have a little bit of a percentage point or two there. And I just think it's better to bring in the hate for their things than to try to mess with your hate. That's interesting. I like that level two play. Are you bringing out all of your Chalice? It would really depend, like we mentioned, on the sort of the concentration. If I saw they had a ton of one drops, I would think I think I shave a couple, 
but uh, an early one-on-one -on -one could still be very good. But later, it, I'm chucking it to Hazret most likely, and that's not what I want to do. I think that's an interesting distinction with the mono red prison deck that you've been playing and this Thalia Stompy deck, which Hazret gives you an out to your useless cards in a way that Thalia Stompy doesn't really. Yeah, although I think Thalia Stompy only has um, Simeon Spirit Guide in the useless camp, and so I think you have a little bit more. Like we don't, there's no rituals in that deck. Gemstone Cavern kind of is what it is. Sometimes you tap it and then drop another one to tap it to get an extra mana and just kind of yeah. go on from there. So it's not it's not really a big deal. Yeah, that's pod racing. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, this question is about Phoenix, guys. Our favorite deck! How, really, in the end, how good is Chalice versus Phoenix? As we mentioned, they're still able to get their cast triggers with Thing in the Ice and Phoenix. So, they are burning the cards. They're not getting the draw card advantage. But flipping a, a Thing in the Ice is sometimes just enough, right? So, do you think that... A Chalice player should side any out, side all out, still jam it on one. I'm jamming it on one. I mean, I I, I don't know. I don't know what other plan I would have there. I, and then when I played, when I the one time I did play it, it worked out pretty well when I did that. So I I feel pretty good about that as a play. I I know that there's a little bit of of kind of talk around trying to jam it on two instead to turn off thing in the ice and Manamorphose because those are both those are both very powerful cards. But I still think I'm going for it on one and just trying to stop them. I, I concur. I think Chalice is a nice roadblock. You probably want additional hate or your own threat to basically prevent them from getting too much tempo or having too much of a board presence. But Chalice on one is such an effective way of keeping them from finding their answers and their threats because the deck is relatively threat light. I think this raises an interesting question, or at least a confirmation, that uh, Chalice does not prevent the copies that you get off of a pyromancer's ascension no it does not yeah that's also another thing that's worth noting i was playing on magic online and i did not know that was the case until i went no the game's messed up and i looked it up and went no oh the same thing with shattering spray those are copies okay yeah. all right i hate when i do that on on moto where i'm like oh i found a bug oh wait yeah i just don't <laughs> nope, get the I'm rules just bad at magic yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think in our conversation with Ross, he stressed the value of just churning through your deck with all your cantrips. And I think that if they, if you can't get that value for your Is It Phoenix deck, I think it just seems like a very powerful play to me. Yeah, I think that I think everyone's correct in that one. I think that this is really an example of make them have it. So like, there, there are going to be times where they're going to be able to flip the thing in the ice or find a way to discard two Phoenix and get him back. But that is so rare that I think you just need to jam it on one and say, hey, I'm doing this. Can you do anything about this? And also, I mean, if their only answer is a braid, they're going to be digging to that answer. Right. And you're likely running other prison pieces like an ensnaring bridge or something like that, correct? Exactly. So. So at that point, you might be putting Chalice on two. Yeah, oh, that's the best. That's the best. When you have Chalice on one, and then you get it, and then you know that they can't get out of it anymore, it's... Especially if you have Ensnaring Bridge out, I think Chalice on two is maybe the better play, since they're not going to attack you through that Ensnaring Bridge, and oftentimes they're counting on a Braid to deal with artifacts. It's worth noting that the Phoenix deck can really get those Phoenixes out pretty quick. Not all the time, but they can. And sometimes Ensnaring Bridge isn't enough, because you will have three cards in hand. And I don't, I don't know the, the exact math on this. Maybe we could break that down sometime later. But there has been an alarming amount of times I have both had it done to me and seen it in streamers' videos where they get the bridge down and the phoenixes just get right under it. Yeah, and I mean, and if they draw their one of shadow storm, so be it. You yeah, know, at least at least you kept them from digging to it again on the exactly. on one. If you draw your one of four mana hate card, good, you did it. Good job, you beat me. You've earned it. Yeah, exactly. You drew better, dude. So. At this point, should we all spend 60 bucks on the card and get a playset of Chalice of the Void? I particularly enjoy it. I don't think it's going to get cheaper anytime soon. I think if you want to play this strategy, buy now before it inevitably gets to 100 bucks a card. But you do you. It's not for everybody, and, and I understand and recognize that. You heard it here first, folks. You do you. We're going to take a quick break, and when we return, we are going to hop into the wind down and talk about some of the recent news and spoilers we got from War of the Spark. Stay with us.
you know, the thing about modern is I try so hard and I got so far, but I go to these tournaments and I find out that in the end, it doesn't really matter. <laughs> That's just the one thing. So how how is this a song that everybody knows and I don't know? Can I just try I just be so honest? Hard. Like I have never listened to Linkin Park ever, and people were freaking out, and I was like, "Wait, this is like a well known song." Oh, okay. it's like one of the most famous it. songs, like literally ever. I would say in the history of the world, it's like in the top ten most famous songs ever. All right, go so so it goes Eleanor Eleanor Rigby, and then this song by Linkin Park, and then Stairway to Heaven is what we're thinking, kind of like down the famous. And then famous number song four list. is the birthday song. I, five is Highway to Hell. I think it just shows where we are in our life, Dave, and also where we were in our life when that song came out. Yeah, I, I was a 11 year old, I think, and when that song came out, Lincoln Park really made me feel emotions for the first time. Well, no joke. The first time I heard Lincoln Park, I was watching some dudes do BMX tricks at a half pipe, and someone played it on their speaker. And I think that sort of just encapsulates what you need to know about it. <laughs> but really, this wind down is not about Lincoln Park as as much a as bit. Uh, the, our other podcast, all about late '90s, early aught alt rock, is. In this podcast, we want to talk about the latest spoilers we received for More of the Spark, as well as I kind of want to talk about this trailer that was premiered at PAX East over the weekend. Well, that's I mean that's the whole reason we're talking about Lincoln Park in the end, which is yeah. Like a cover version of that was used in this trailer, which people either thought was pretty cool or kind of corny, or a little bit of both. I think it's both. <laughs> Licensed That's... music from Wizards of the Coast. That trailer was sweet. That's all I have good. to say about it. It was it, great. It was good. It was good. Yeah, it was really good. Yeah, it was even good the first time I saw it with no volume because the Twitch oh stream malfunctioned. And even on mute, I was like, oh, this is happening. Yeah, I think it's very easy for something that to be super corny and goofy, and I think that it did have it was able to convey a pretty serious tone in a a way that maybe earlier magic trailers had not been able to. I just think that they really committed to a much higher level of of production than they ever they had, had licensed before. music from a very very popular band. They had licensed music exactly. They also had clearly a higher quality of character animation, even though it was still kind of like three D video game ish. It's way better than the sort of like, yeah, it wasn't like morphing, the animatics morphing stuff. card art stuff that they usually do. I mean, I, look, I don't I don't slight them for not having everything animated kind of on the when they do the morphing card art, but this was like, hey, we're gonna make a sequence just for this trailer and it's going to be great and no other trailer deserves it more than the culmination of a story that started in what 2015 2016 so a lot of the sets since oath of the gatewatch perhaps even since magic origins have been i would go even further and say since alara which, which is really really our cruel tomato and we see bolas introduces a character that he currently is yeah yeah true yeah, so well done, Wizards of the Coast. We know you're listening, and we tip our hats. And honestly, real fast, I'm just going to say well done on the Mythic Invitational. We're not going to talk about that uh, format or anything like that, but it was a fun tournament to watch. And again, they committed to really high to a production level. Uh, well done on getting above 100,000 viewers on Twitch at a single point in time, and so uh, that was pretty awesome too. And I, I mean, while I love all the CFB regulars that cast the modern, give me day nine doing some modern play by play or some modern colored commentary, please. I I really just want Kibler and David Williams. Honestly, day nine's fine, but give me, give me the, uh, the, the charismatic, uh, magic people. Yeah. I'll go on record as a Kibler fan. Yeah. Congrats to Andrea Mangucci for winning the first mythic invite and especially congrats on getting a new computer since I knew that was important to him ahead of this mythic invite and why he didn't buy a computer because he learned that that was part of the grand prize in this event he's gonna get yeah, a really good computer to fate, right that's the saying yeah such an amazing story that was <laughs> yeah but i want to go into some of the cards that jumped out to us because usually when we get spoiler season a lot of it is standard or limited fodder but we have a few here that could actually be modern playable which is pretty exciting for us the, po the power level of the set seems pretty high so far yeah so i think we're all just going to talk about one card that we found interesting give a hot take or two and then we'll save our more we'll save our more formulated thoughts for a later episode where we can pick a few more and really dive into it for sure shane you want to take the best card 
Yeah, I think this is the best card, but also I'm going to take it because I'm probably the most likely person to cast this card. Um, so we have our Strictly Better Diabolic Edict. Uh, it's Liliana's Triumph. It's a one and a black instant, and each opponent sacrifices a creature. If you control a Liliana Planeswalker, each opponent also discards a card. So first thing to note, it does not say target opponent. It says each opponent. So you know, fun for all your EDH players, but also it gets around uh, targeting restrictions like Leyline of Sanctity. And so that's pretty going to be pretty good for the Bogles matchup if that's a thing you're concerned about in your local metagame. Um, I'm just, I think right off the bat, I'm not sure this is an immediate main deck inclusion in black-green based mid-range decks. It could certainly be argued for, you know, maybe one or two of perhaps, but you know, you're often going to have a Liliana Walker that can tick down to get rid, get rid of a creature. You can maybe protect her by keeping one of your own creatures back or something like that, and then cast this the next turn for some kind of maximum value. Uh, it's maybe even a nice sequence with five mana up. You know, you, you cast both those spells right in a row. It's probably really good in like a grindy matchup where both the boards are going to remain relatively clear. So if you're up against another mid-range deck and you're both removing each other's threats, then you know, it's going to be harder to get the value of the discard potentially in that matchup, but maybe they're like holding a removal spell. So you're not playing into the removal spell. They're going to sandbag it. It lets you cast it and then they have to discard it. And then you stick your threat long enough to ride it to victory. That's kind of a scenario I can see. I think it probably also has some value in like a Grixis control deck or an Esper control deck, perhaps, but those aren't decks that I'm expert with at all, so I can't speak to that. It's just something that I think I can see being valuable as well. Perfect. But I think it's cool. I mean, we don't have anything like that in modern right now. We do not have a play playable edict, so it's a cool new option for people to experiment with. Yep, totally agree. I'm excited about that one. Mind if I go next? Please. Do it. Do it, man. So we talked about last week how I love Negate and how I love to play Negate out of blue-white control, basically. And so what they gave us is uh, Dovin's Veto, which is a blue and a white for an instant. This spell can't be countered. Counter target non-creature spell. So it is an uncounterable but more difficult to cast Negate. So I definitely think this card is playable. It's definitely more of a utility player in the same way that, that Liliana's Triumph is more of a utility player. But I think it could be a really important piece for blue-white control against decks that kind of run like combo finishes, but also manage to pack um, some disruption. So you think about like a scape shift that might kind of that might run spell pierce out of the sideboard for when you try to counter their scape shift, then they can spell pierce you. Um, so this, this way you can just kind of escape shift and go on and it'll be, it'll be fine. So I, I think that a lot of people look at this and think that it's going to be good in counter wars and it's really not going to be that great in counter wars because you can't use it to protect something that you're trying to do because if your opponent has another counter, they're just going to use their counter to target the main spell again against decks that have big non-creature spells that you want to stop this, this will target it. Everything from sorcery, instant planeswalker, you know, non-creature artifacts, all everything like that. You got enchantments. Yep, you got them all. I think that's you it. World enchantments. <laughs> if you want to get rid of someone's Sarah's Sarah's aviary, you can. This is the way you do it. <laughs> <laughs> the best answer to Sarah's aviary we've ever seen. Exactly. <laughs> so, speaking of planeswalkers, the card I want to touch on that. I don't think I'm ever going to cast this card, but it just seems so very good to me initially. So we'll we'll talk about it more, and we, we can all chime in eventually, but the card is uh, Teferi Time Traveler. So uh, this is a three-mana walker, a colorless, a blue, and a white. Static ability, each opponent can cast spells only at any time they could cast a sorcery. So no instant speed shenanigans, no countering, just casting it when they can cast as a sorcery. No boon satyrs being flashed in. Exactly. <laughs> He has two abilities, a plus one, which reads until your next turn, you may cast sorcery spells as if they had flash, and a minus three, return up to one target artifact, creature, or enchantment to its owner's hand, and draw a card. It has four loyalty. So this card just seems bananas to me. It has all this interesting casting restrictions. It has an ability that bounces and draws. I think this is just going to be a nightmare to play against, and I think it will see its way into blue-white control. In what form, we'll talk about later, but I think this is a modern playable card. Yeah, I mean, just looking at three mana, kind of our initial hurdle is cleared. It's a low CMC walker. It has some utility right off the bat. 
if when you play it and then plus it up one, it goes to five loyalty, which is a ton for a three mana walker. So it protects itself pretty well there, just in terms of being avoiding burn. And if you're playing a control deck, then you're probably keeping the board pretty clear as well. So I think it, it does a good amount. I think it seems pretty good in like a control mirror, but I don't play these things, so it just seems good to me. I can see it being a sideboard card, potentially. I think there's a lot of opponents where it's pretty dead in a way that you don't want your Planeswalkers to be. Yeah. I worry, though, that the static ability trading for an ultimate might be something that prevents some of these walkers that we're seeing, including this one, from actually making it to modern because you're never really going to count on them to win you a game in the way that a lot of the modern playable walkers do. Yeah, it doesn't march up to anything, right? Yeah. Marches up to you casting other Teferi and winning with him. Oh, too bad. Consolation <laughs> prize. Yeah, it's like how much value is a control deck getting with this at three mana, right? I mean, it's like Stan says, I think it's probably a sideboard card against strategies where it does a ton of work for you, where other spells may not. And I think that remains to be seen what those are. But I think that, like, I agree with you, Zach. I think it, it has a lot of interesting things. I mean, even when you play against something like a Voice of Resurgence, like, you see how annoying it is to not be able to cast spells on their turn. And so when you have to wait, and then you're like, okay, I can't cast this on their turn, I have to wait and then use my mana less efficiently on my turn when I wanted to be casting an instant on their turn. It just becomes frustrating and becomes, you know, it becomes mana advantage in that way. And I can see how that can do some work. All right, the last card we're going to talk about is Dread Horde Invasion. A two mana enchantment costs one and a black. At the beginning of your upkeep, you lose one life and amass one. Amass is a new mechanic that they're introducing in War of the Spark, which reads, put a 1-1 counter on an army you control. If you don't control an army, create a 0-0 black zombie army creature token first. The card also reads, whenever a zombie token you control with power 6 or greater attacks, it gains lifelink until end of turn. So that's not an amass ability, that's just unique to Dreadhorde Invasion. I've heard this card called Bigger Blossom recently. Yeah, and that's why it sticks out to me. It because it has this very clear comparison to another modern playable card. I think could actually make it interesting in some of the decks that play Bitter Blossom. And a deck we talk about every once in a while is Black White Tokens as the strategy that's it's not quite on the bubble. It's pretty fringe at this point, but it always seems like a strategy that could get there one day as new tools are printed. And I can imagine a scenario where if a tokens or bitter blossom player is able to turn more of their tokens sideways, then they can count on something like Dreadhorde Invasion to hold back a blocker without losing too much tempo. I don't know if it's necessarily the card that that deck or other decks have been looking for, but at two mana and a repeatable board presence, it seems like something that could find a home eventually. I gotta say, I'm not really a fan of this card. <laughs> Wow, I I think that the bitter blossom read on it is is discounting the utility you get out of having multiple tokens yeah, from from bitter exactly. blossom and a mass makes you not be able to have multiple tokens. So um, I'll be curious to see what happens as a result. But I feel like you'd have to play it in uh you could play it in a deck with zombies maybe and some kind of like zombie tribal thing to make giant zombies or maybe you know you lord up a bunch of your zombies and then this one gives them lifelink in addition to make you know having this build you an army but it's only the tokens um, that have lifelink when it swings by the oh, way, the way oh, zombie token yeah. yeah yeah that's true so they so they already thought of thought ahead of that and kind of fixed it they didn't want to push zombie tribal in modern yeah, too much there's too many good lords this is for your zombie EDH deck where you're making zombie tokens and doing something wild with them. I mean, I think people are into this card, so I'll be, you know, I'll be curious to see what happens. But to me, it feels like it's more of like a vague allusion to a really powerful card than than something that's really like it. It's a fever dream of bitter blossom. Kind of. <laughs> yeah, it falls into that trap that we see sometimes, right? Where it's like, this looks like another card, but it only looks like it. But we'll see. One of the things that I like about it that we're not talking about is that, in theory, the zombie token can offset all the life you've lost. And I've seen a lot of games where the Bitter Blossom player loses to themselves. And, and yeah. this could potentially help mitigate that risk somewhat. Yeah, first it gets you all back, and then it starts just 
compounding from there, right? You get the six back, and then you're seven up and only down one. Hey, make seven. Up yours. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's definitely a threat that's resilient to removal, right? It's just slow. So maybe yep. there's some kind of black controlling deck that wants this or something like that. Maybe it's Rat Moon. <laughs> rat Moon. This is a good opportunity to say that Rat Moon is the next dive down that we're going to cover on next week's episode. And this is an April Fool's joke that's going to come out on April 5th. <laughs> All right, that wraps up this week's show. If you haven't yet, make sure you subscribe to our podcast so you get the latest episodes as soon as they come out. And if you use iTunes or Apple Podcasts, please leave us a rating and review. If you'd like to submit a question to the podcast or pick our brain on something in modern, tweet us at the dive down, all one word, or email the dive down at gmail.com. If you see us on Reddit, feel free to send us a message there as well. We typically have some fun conversations on our thread every week, as well as occasional threads we put out between the weeks as we review tournaments that are happening in real time. As always, special thanks to the bands Nowhere and Spaceblood for letting us use their music. And until next week, get out there and chalice the voice. Well, I think that puts a wrap on uh, Grand Prix Calgary. Well, wait, actually, I want to, I want to say nothing. <laughs>